So uh, without any further delay, let's go right into our reading. John chapter 17. Chapter 17. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, Glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. All right, there we go again, chapter 17. All right, now, we're going to get right into this. We're going to just jump right, right into um, this beginning part here. Um, and as you see here, it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes unto heaven and said, All right, now, we, we see here that he's getting ready to pray. He's praying to his Father. Now, keep in mind that it's important for us to understand that prayer is not a prayer of the eyes, ears, nose, it's not a posture. What did Jesus do? He, what, lifted up his eyes to heaven. Sometimes people get, when I was a kid, they used to smack you in the back of the head if you didn't bow your head when you prayed. You remember that? They say, it's time to pray, and you'd be looking around, and they <laughs> hit you right in the back because they wanted you to what? Bow your head. Now, there's nothing wrong with bowing your head, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but keep in mind, bowing your head don't mean that you would, that means that you're ready for prayer. The true aspect of being ready for prayer is that your heart is ready. Good morning. Your heart being ready is more important than any posture that you can take. Some people can look all, you know, and sanctimonious and all the way that they, they present themselves and their physical stature of how they pray. On their knees, head bowed, laying on the floor, arms. And there's nothing wrong with that. But keep that in mind. That don't buy you any points <laughs> in prayer. 
The true aspect of a prayer going through is the heart being ready to communicate with the Lord. That's the true posture. All right. Amen. And how your body is, is, is situated doesn't really mean a whole lot. All right. But then he goes on and he says, Father, the hour is come. And we talked about this before. Jesus is now saying this is the hour. This is the time. And it ain't just the hour for that day or for that week. It's the hour for the ages. This, he's about to fulfill everything that was written in Genesis and, 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 and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy representing the sacrifice for sin. He is, as John pointed out, when John saw him, he said, behold, here comes the what? Lamb of God. John recognized that this was the sacrifice that had come into the world and that he was going to offer up sacrifices once and for all for what? For sin. For everybody's sin. For all time. All right? All those things were, 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 were given metaphors and types and glimpses through a lot of the festivals and, and the activities that we saw in the book of Numbers. I mean, and, and, and in the, uh, the book of Leviticus. The structuring of the temple and the sacrifices and the killing of the of the uh, of the lamb and all of the the uh, offering of the turtle doves and the, the he goats and all of those things represented a shadowing a metaphor and a type of the true lamb of god the true sacrifice that was coming into this earth to die for sin and all of those things pointed to it everything did it was all written about jesus and it's beautiful to see uh, when you begin to, to discover all the beauty that is in the uh, Old Testament writing, how it relates to the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, you could just spend so much time uh, in going through it, and I don't think we could ever exhaust it. But it's important to recognize it. And so Jesus is saying, the hour has come. The hour is come. And he said, Glorify the Son, that the Son may glorify thee. Now, keep in mind this aspect of, of how the Father is glorifying the Son, and the Son is glorifying the Father. Just keep that in mind. That's something that they do one for another. You ever hear the phrase, one hand washes the other? All right? That's important to keep in mind. All right? So just, 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 just keep that in mind. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. Verse 2. And he says, as thou hast given uh, him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many uh, that thou hast given him. And he's speaking of himself. All right. Jesus has power over how much flesh? All, all flesh. So that means there's no man that can stand up to Jesus. But now wait a minute. If you're trying to tell me that Jesus has power over all flesh, aren't they getting ready to arrest him? Aren't they getting ready to, to beat him? Shouldn't he be able to just knock him out? He could if he wanted to. But he doesn't want to. Because he wants to do what? Fulfill, fulfill the scripture. Exactly. All right. Um, and remember, he says, no man taketh my life. He, I lay it down freely. And I take it back up again. Exactly. Verse 3. He says, this is eternal life. Oh, wait a minute. Who's saying this? Jesus. Jesus is telling us what eternal life is. Now, let's see if it goes over our head or not. Let's see if we can grasp this. This is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou have sent. Wow. That's it. See, you have to do what? Know Jesus. All right. And in knowing him truly, it, it automatically states that if you know him in true relationship, he also what? Knows you. That's the key. You know him, he knows you. But you know, notice this. Let me read it again. I'm going to read it a different way. And, and you'll see the problem here. Let me read verse 3 again. I'm going to change something in here. This is eternal life, that thou may know thee, the only true God, and Mohammed. 
Ah. Uh, this is eternal life that they may know thee, the only true God and Buddha and good works. And I mean, I, I can't substitute that and with nothing else. It has to be knowing the only true God and what? Jesus Christ. That's it. If you want eternal life, you got to know the Father through Jesus Christ. Through nothing else. If you come any other way, and that's the problem that the world has. And this is why Jesus, as he goes through this, he's going to talk about the issue with the world. Because the world, <coughs> excuse me, the world doesn't want you to be narrow-minded like that. That's what they're going to call it. That you're narrow-minded, that you, you, you don't consider other people's views. I'm not trying to consider other people's views. I'm trying to understand what eternal life is. See, that's like somebody trying to tell you, well, what's two plus two? Four. Well, well what about five? What about three? What about 18? There's a lot of numbers in the world. Why does two plus two only have to be four? That's narrow-minded. Why don't we make, why don't we let two plus two be whatever it was? If some people want two plus two to be four, then fine. But if some people want two plus two to be eight, you should let it be eight. And if some people want two plus two to be three, then you should let it be three. What's wrong with that? With that? Whether you let it be three or not, two plus two is never what? Three. It's always what? Four. That's just a natural given truth. And that's what eternal life is. This is what Jesus is saying. Eternal life is not politically correct. Eternal life is not trying to appease people. Eternal life is like two plus two. It's one answer. One answer only. And that answer is knowing the Father through Jesus Christ. And this world is not like that. That's why they don't like Christians. They don't like people that follow Jesus because they're saying that you are trying to tell everybody else they're wrong and you're the only one that's right. No, I'm not right. I'm just telling you what Jesus said through his word uh, uh, as he revealed it to us that knowing the Father through Jesus is the only way you can get eternal life. Now, there's some things that I, I, I can go, well, you know, some people teach this, some people teach that. This, I don't do that with. This, I go dogmatic. This is it. There's no if, ands, or buts. You know, if you're trying to go any, any place that is eternal and life connected, you need to know Jesus. Now, a lot of people are going to have eternal death, which we're going to talk about a little bit. But imagine dying eternally, always dying. Like, you know, because when you say eternal life, you're thinking of always what? Always living, always growing. See, everybody's going to have eternity. Some are going to have eternal dying, and some are going to have eternal living. And we just need to make sure that we understand what it takes to get eternal life and not eternal death. All right? So it's a very big statement here that Jesus says, and this is the crux, this is the problem that most people have. Verse 4. He says, I have glorified thee. Here we're talking about this again. Uh, on the earth. Jesus said, I glorified the Father. Where? On, earth. on the earth. How did he do that? How did he glorify the Father on earth? Well, you know what? The nice thing about it is he answers, he answers, he tells us right in the next statement. I have what? Finished the work which thou giveth me to do. And he came to this earth to die to pay for the sin, and to raise again, and to gain all power, and to gain all of all authority. And he says, I have finished the work. Now, at the time that he's making this, he had not been crucified yet. He had, But yet he's speaking it from a standpoint of, of understanding that he is going uh, from a timeline, from our perspective, through this entire uh, uh, um, event that's about to happen. In his mind, and in how he does, because keep in mind, when we talk about eternity, and this is another thing that's important, a lot of times we think eternity means a whole lot of time. If you, if, when you go into eternity, you just have a whole lot of time. No. 
That's not what eternity really means. Eternity means you don't really have to deal with time. It's different. You outside of time. Now, after saying that, I can't explain it to you. You know why? Because I never experienced it. And I have nothing to compare it to. Because see, that's why God the Father can say, whom I've known, I've predestined and have, uh, 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 have called. Because God lives outside of time. See, we think that because God knows our, our, our future in comparison to our past, that that means he, he knows, uh, our, he, he's going with us through this time. No, he's observing time, but he's not conformed to time. And not to get real scientific and everything, but even people, uh, scientists that have done various studies have proven that time is a physical property. How have they proven that? Well, time can actually slow down and time can speed up. They've shown that through what they consider to be, the, you know, a couple of uh, atomic clocks that they have. And they have one clock at one altitude, another clock at another altitude, and they can show that one clock runs faster than the other. And they also put one uh, atomic clock on an airplane and flew it around the earth westward and another clock on a plane and flew it around the earth eastward and the times differ once that happens. Time then can be manipulated. Time can be sped up. Time can be slowed down. We know that also in the book of Joshua. What happened? He made time to do what? Stand still. How it all happened? I don't know. I don't know the physics of, physics of God. I just know that even our scientists today have come to the conclusion that time can be manipulated. And that's just, that ain't Christian scientists. That's just, you know, your everyday secular scientists, your, your basic uh, people that study physics and quantum physics and, and string theory and all that. They've, they've shown various different things about time that it's actually a physical property. And what does a physical property mean? That means it can be like this pencil. It's a physical property. So I can, I can actually do things with this pencil that I want to do with it. I can move it from here to there. Well, they're saying that at certain, at certain very small levels, we can actually do things, very small things, to time with our own knowledge. So imagine what God can do with time. Because time is something he can move like he moves his pencil. He can, you know, I mean, I can't even imagine all the stuff. But keep this in mind. Eternity will then mean that time for you will most likely, probably, could be something like how we handle this pencil. You can handle time. And that's hard sometimes for us to think about. It, but eternity is not just a lot of time. Eternity means you are outside of time. And you can manipulate time to some degree. Now, I'm going to get a headache if I go any further than that. That's about as deep as I'm going to get with that. Because it's very, it's very uh, sophisticated stuff. But a lot of you, you young kids, if y'all get into physics or whatever, quantum theory, if y'all go that level in school, y'all will be talking about what I just said. Because this is some of the stuff that a lot of our scientists are, are dealing with today. All right. So let's move along. All right. Now, um... He said, I had finished the work which thou has given me to do. We need to make sure that we understand that we have a job to do for the Lord, and he wants us to finish it. He has gifted you for whatever task it is that you are here to do. Whatever it is that you're here to do, God has given you the tools to do it with. Your uh, uh, job is to discover the tools, to discover the, that's why you seek him. That's why you go through the word. Because you want to know, God, who am I in relationship to uh, what you need here? And you'll recognize that no matter um, um, what is here uh, and how it's covered, when God wants those tools and gifts to be discovered, we discover them. Now look around you. Look at all the metal and all the various things that we have made out of various you know, things. All this stuff, all this metal, this iron, this steel, all of it was buried where? In the, in the ground, in the ground, in the earth. And man dug it up, discovered some things about it, and began to produce things out of the earth, out of the dirt. Well, 
in your heart, in you, in your being, God has hidden some treasures. And he wants you to do the same thing. He wants you to dig in there, figure it out, pray, discuss what you can do, discuss your talents with the Lord, and let the Lord tell you what you are to be doing. And the, uh, the Lord Jesus said, I have glorified you by finishing the work you have sent me to do. That's our job. We need to glorify God by doing that. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So let's go on. Um, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me. Oh, this, here it is glorifying again. I glorified you, Father. Now, Father, you glorify me with thine own uh, self, with the glory which I had with thee before the, the world was. Wait a minute. So this means that Jesus had glory, great glory that was with the Father before the world was? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He had glory. But then Philippians tells us that he what? He stripped himself of his glory, took on the form, the form of what? A sinful flesh, and he dwelt among us. But now he's about ready to take, take that, that form of sinful flesh off and put back on what? The glory that he had before the foundations of the world. See, we're talking about God here. <laughs> this, is, this is God. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou hast given me out of the world. So he's saying now, I have told the men in this world that, John, that you've given me all about who you are. That's what that means. He's talking about his disciples, all right, those followers of him. He says, thy, uh, thy, thine they were, and thou hast given them me, and they have kept thy what? Thy word. All right. They have kept your word. All right. Now, we're going to go right. We're going to talk about that in just a bit, that aspect of they have kept their word. But let's look at verse 7 first, and then we'll get to 8 and do with the word, deal with the word portion. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are who? Are of thee. All right. So Jesus is recognizing that there can, nothing can happen. This whole plan, this whole aspect of me coming and doing this and fulfilling all of the, the, uh, the types and the metaphors and all of the things that were written of old about me came from the Father. And the son fulfilled them. All right. Now let's go to verse eight. For I have given unto them thy word. And he keeps talking about this word. And we talked about this before. And I want to read it again. Uh, let's go, go to Psalms 38. And let's read this again. I think it's important to keep this in mind. Psalms 38 about the word and then you understand some something about why it's so important for us to reach our goal to go through this entire word as we are led by the Spirit of God let's understand how he looks at the word all right now here's a psalm of David Psalm 138 did I say 138 or did I say 30 I said 38 I'm sorry Psalms 138 excuse me Psalms 138, and it's the Psalm of David. And look at what uh, he says here. He says, I will praise thee with my whole heart before the gods. And remember, that's a lowercase g. I will sing praises unto thee. All right, we, 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 I'm not going to get into that aspect about what that means, but we'll deal with that another time. But the point we want to get to on this particular uh, portion of Scripture is dealing with that aspect of his word. All right, verse 2. I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast manifest thy word above all thy name. You see that? Remember, this is written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's letting us know that he values his, you knowing his word more than you knowing his name. 
But guess what? If you know his, his word, what's going to happen? You'll know his name. You see? It's important to keep in mind. Because a lot of people are going to know his name, but not know his word. We're going we're gonna to see that in a minute. They don't know his word, but they do know his name. That's not the key. Know the word. You will then know his name and know his true name. And that means know truly who he is. All right. And then it goes on and talks about even how the, the kings of the earth will praise thee uh, at the hearing of thy word and so forth and so on. And, he, and this, this whole one, 138 Psalm is important to keep in mind in dealing with how powerful the word of God is. All right. Well, let's go back to John. All right. All right. Let's read 8 again. He says, For I have given unto them thy word, which thou hast given me, and they have what? Received them, and have known surely that I come out from thee. And, and, and this is important. When it says that Jesus is saying, I have come out from thee, what he's saying is, me and you are what? One. And I, I'm saying this for lack of a better vocabulary to say it. Whatever God is made of, Jesus is made of. You know, and I, I, that ain't really right to say what he's made of because he ain't made of anything. Because everything that, that can be made, he what? He made, he made it. So I'm, I'm, I'm losing the ability to describe him because he's just that awesome. But whatever it is that God is made of, whatever it is that makes God God, the Father of the Father, Jesus is the same stuff. That's why they're one, and that's why they're both God. You see what I'm saying? No matter how many times you cut this rug, this rug is still made up of the same stuff. You can divide it all you want to. It's still the rug, and that's a poor analogy, but you get the point, right? Jesus and, and the Father and the Spirit of God are what? One. All right. Uh, where I leave it? Verse 9. All right. Did I finish verse 8? Yeah, I did. Okay, verse 9. Look at what Jesus says. I pray for them. He's praying for who? Them. Who is the them? The disciples. The disciples. All right. I pray not for the world. Ooh, wait a minute. Jesus is saying, I will not, at this point, for this prayer, I am not praying for the world. Now, we know that on the cross, Jesus utters a prayer for, for everybody, he says, Father, what? Forgive them, because they what? Know they, they know not what they do. All right? And that's a, certainly a prayer for this, for this poor lost world of ours. But right here, he goes, I pray not for them. I mean, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. Now, we're going to get, a, get a, a good understanding about this world here in a minute. We talked about it in the beginning, but we're going to deal with it a little bit more. But for them which thou hast given me for thou for they are thine so he's saying i'm praying for the ones that you have given me because they belong to who me. to you they belong to you father all right verse verse 11 it says and now i am no more in the world here he is with this world again and he's saying i am now no more in this world but thou but these are in the world and I come to thee. Now, Jesus is saying that he is what? Going to the Father. This is why he's saying he's no longer what? In this world. As far as he's concerned, once again, his, his mission is what? Finished. This is how he sees it. This is how he's talking about it. All right? He goes, I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me. So he's saying, once again, keep them. All right? Uh, um, there is a, um, an anointing, an authority, a God-given anointing, a God-given authority to help keep the followers of the Lord. Because guess what? You can't do it on your own. You, you, you're going to need some help from the Lord. And the Lord says he will, he will give you that. And he says, keep them which thou hast given me, that they may what? Be one as we are one. Now, here's a key right here. This is one in, in understanding, one in fellowship, one in focus. 
One of the things that the devil has been very successful at is to keep us from being one and focused. See, being one doesn't mean that you have to do things like I do it. That's the biggest misconception that we have in being one. That's why you have all this fighting amongst, you know, different so-called religious sectors, especially within Christianity. Because everybody's saying, well, if you don't do it like me, then you are, you know, you're a heretic. Now, there are certain things that you have to have, like we talked about. You can't get eternal life without who? Jesus. All right? you, can't, you can't deviate on that. But remember, there were some things that God called Paul to do, and there were some things that God called uh, Barnabas to do. And it was to the point that where, at some point, they had to be like, wait a minute. Paul, you can't jump on Barnabas because he's doing this. And, and the Spirit of God had to do what? Separate him. All right? And was it Paul and Barnabas or Paul and Silas that he separated? Barnabas. It was Barnabas. Okay, make sure I got the right one. He's, so he said we had to separate. But that didn't mean that, well, if, if Paul and Barnabas had to be separated, well, we know Paul was doing God's will, so we don't know what Barnabas was doing. So you could go that line, but that would be incorrect. Just because Barnabas was doing something slightly different than Paul doesn't mean that Barnabas was not in the will of God. He was. And we always have to remember that. It's important to keep in mind that there, there are uh, uh, varieties and, and, and uh, diversities of gifts and callings. All right? So um, as you go along in here, what you'll see as we go through this, he's, he's telling them... Um, Father, keep them, all right? And he's saying that they may be one as we are one. Look at verse 12. He says, while I was with them in the world, there he gets, he keeps talking about this world aspect, but he's saying, while I was with them in this world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou had given me, I kept, and none of them were lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled. Now, what in the world does this mean? All right. It's important to keep in mind. We talked about people that know God, right? And not just know him, but know him in a sense that he also what? Knows them. So you just can't know the name of Jesus. You just can't say, oh, Jesus, Jesus. You know, you just can't say, Lord, Lord. Right? And figure, well, that's going to get me in. All right? Now, Judas was the Judas was is the son of perdition. Well, what that means is that he came in devilish. He came in with a devilish heart, devilish agenda. Whatever it is that makes the son of perdition the son of perdition, he was that when Jesus called him, when Jesus said, follow me. So he even invited a person that was with a devilish makeup to follow him. All right, which goes to show you that everybody that's following Jesus is not a saint. There's a lot of devils following Jesus. All right, let's, let's just go back uh, to Matthew. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 7. <coughs> Excuse me. I just want to read something here. Because some people say, well, no, I don't believe that Judas was a, a, a devilish when Jesus called him. And you, and you know why they say it? Because they say, well, when Jesus sent the disciples out, they cast out devils and did all this stuff. And and some people believe that, well, if, that, if they cast out devils, uh, they had to do it through the power of God. And that means that they had to, to actually be born again. Not necessarily. All right? Not necessarily. See, and, 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 well, let's just read this. There's a lot of things that you can do from an authority standpoint, but not be not belong to something. All right. But let's take a look at what what, what Jesus says in Matthew uh, chapter seven, verse twenty one. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus, God, God, not everyone that calls on his what name. Look at this. He says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the what? The will of my Father, which is in heaven. 
Now look at verse 22. Many, how many? Many. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And, and in thy name have cast out devils. All right? Remember, that's one of the things people say. That's why they don't believe Judas was a, was a, uh, he was one that was saved but then lost the salvation. Judas was the son of perdition. He was a devil when, God, when Jesus called him. But look, many will, and, 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 uh, and in my name will have cast out, we've cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. All right, and this is what they're saying they've done. Jesus doesn't deny the works. But look what he says, verse 23. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work what? Iniquity or lawlessness. All right? Or hypocrisy. All right? They are not his. They know Jesus. They know religious ways. They know a lot of religious stuff. But they don't know, but, but Jesus doesn't know them. They call him what? Lord. But Jesus says, I don't know you. And see, and that's the thing. This is where it is. This is why you, you, you can't fool God. You can't fool God. You see, I remember being a kid and getting caught doing something and making up a story real quick to get, get out of it. I've done that. Well, I think we all have. We've all done that. And then you think, oh, okay, I didn't get in trouble and I got by. And they believed the little story that I told. And, 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 and you go on through, through life and that never, you, know, you never get caught. All right? I remember I, I stole this, this little boy's Batmobile when I was a little kid. I stole the Batmobile. And my mother told me, she said, where'd you get that from? I said, he gave it to me. Now, he didn't give it to me. I took it. You know, I don't know how old I was, maybe six, seven years old. I took the thing. But I, I remember to this day telling her he gave it to me. Well, I didn't get in trouble. But my mom did say, if I didn't buy it for you, I don't want it in the house. Not to say this, that may, means she didn't believe me. I don't know what it was, but she told me she didn't want it. So rather than me taking it and giving it back to him, I took it outside and I threw it on the ground until it broke. Because if he wasn't having it, I wasn't going to have it. But I didn't get in trouble. You know, it just, you know, I, I was able to do what I had to do. But you can't do that with God. That's what you can't do. You can't get over on God. You can't just say things. You can't, when you say something to somebody and you mean it a certain way, and then they question you about it, then you, oh, well, I didn't mean it that way. I meant it this way. You, you, can, you, know, you can fool all of us some of the time. All right? That's, that's going to happen. But you can't fool God at all. You can't. So you're not going to be able to give excuse. You're not going to be able to. There is no, if, if the Lord tells you you ain't making it, you, you cannot have eternal life. There is nothing you can say. You can't con your way in. You can't find a loophole. Johnny Cochran, F. Lee Bailey, Perry Mason, nobody is going to be able to get you into heaven. So for some of you young folks, y'all don't know who Perry Mason is. That was a popular TV show way back in the, in the days of a, of a very good lawyer. He just did that to confess on the stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not going to get in on some kind of, you know, hook or crook. You have to know Jesus in the sense that he knows you. That has to happen. And that's why we go through the word. Because you have to, he has to get in you. If Jesus doesn't get in you, guess what? He doesn't know you. He don't know you. You may know him. You may be like Judas and follow him and go on and listen and go. A lot of folks go to church. Because these people that we talked about in, in, in Matthew 7, these were not heathens that talk about there is no God. These were, these were religious folks. All right? And these were folks that were doing religious activities and they were going out and prophesying in his name. They were doing religious stuff, but they didn't get Jesus in them. And that should be your prayer. Lord, dwell in me. And we do this. We get him in us. We, we by saturating ourselves through the spirit in his word so that we don't get 
confused. All right, and we're going to, and we, how do we get confused? We're going to get confused. People that get confused are going to get confused by this world. And we're going to get to this aspect about the world. We've been talking a whole lot about that. We're going to get to it in just a bit here. All right, so uh, we see that Judas is the son of perdition. And it also it says that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He was prophesied of that there would be one. All right, and so it's important. David prophesied, my familiar friend who I, 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 I broke bread with, lifted up his hands against me, all right? And so he was, um, Jesus called him friend, but he couldn't call him a saint. You see, Jesus, the Lord Jesus doesn't hate uh, 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 any individual. The Bible says he wished that all would come to repentance. But just because he called you friend don't mean he's going to call you a saint, a child of, of the Father, all right? Verse 13. And now come I to thee. Who's speaking? Jesus. He's saying, now I come I come I to you. He's going to the Father. And these things I speak in the world that they may have joy, uh, my joy, uh, uh, fulfilled in themselves. Now keep this in mind. In this world, we're going to have a lot of things going on. But if we have Jesus, there's one thing that this world cannot take. We always have that hope of eternity. No matter what this, and, and see, we can have some sad days because the world can produce that. But the hope, and sometimes you can almost get homesick. You can be like, Lord, I, you know, you can come now. But, but once again, Jesus told us, and when he showed us how to pray, he said, pray after this manner. You know, and he, he said, uh, um, uh, uh, that we should pray, uh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done, thy what? Kingdom come. He, we should have a desire for God's kingdom to come. We should want it to come because we believe that Jesus said that it's better than the one we're in. Now, sometimes we get so nervous because we're thinking, well, you know what? I ain't doing too bad here. How much better can it get? Well, anybody living a life like that? <laughs> we all recognize that this is a very, very difficult uh, world to live in. And so we should always be praying. But in the meantime, we do have to live in this world. So Jesus says, I will give you that joy so that you always will recognize that you have something to look forward to. You can keep that hope. You always got something to look forward to. You always have a better day coming. Always remember that. Your best day has not happened yet. It's on its way. It has not happened. I don't care how good things get for you, nor how bad things get. You are going to have a better day. You're going to have you. You're going to have the best day ever. Just keep that in mind. That I'm going to have the best day that anybody has ever had. That's a promise for me, and that should be your joy. All right. So he says that uh, he wants us to have his joy. Verse 14. I have given them thy what? Thy word. And the world hath hated them. Okay, let's deal with this world. We've been talking about this world, this world, this world. Let's deal with this. The world is going to hate them mainly because those that know Jesus and have his word in them are not going to agree with the dogma and the goings on of this world. They're not going to agree with it. And the world is going to hate you because of that. You're not going to agree that homosexuality is just an alternate lifestyle. You're not going to agree with that. You're going to say, no, it's a sin. It's wrong. And because you do that, they're going to hate you because they're going to call you prejudice. They're going to say you are, you are, you, they're going to say you are a hater. You hate homosexual. No, I don't hate the homosexual, but I'm not going to say that homosexuality is a viable God ordained lifestyle. I'm not going to say that. You're not going to get me because the words. So then when you stand up for the truth. Now, I don't have anything. Homosexuals want health insurance. They want to buy cheeseburgers and hamburgers. And I ain't trying to stop them from doing, you know, they, they need to eat too. They need, if they go get, get, you know, in an accident, they need to be addressed by the medical community too. They need to be able to go to Walmart and shop too. I'm not against them shopping and buying clothes and getting health care. I'm not against none of that stuff. Everybody needs something, all right? 
<laughs> you so bad. He talking about they going shopping for the wrong kind of clothes. I heard you. <laughs> but whatever, you know, they, they can do what they want to do. But the thing is, they're not going to tell me that it's a God-ordained lifestyle. I'm not going to buy that. No. And if you question me on it, I'm going to tell you, no. God said that's wrong. All right. And so we have to keep that in mind. And I, I mentioned that. That's just one thing. We can go on and on and on and on. All right. But then he t also talks about being in this world and then also being sanctified from the world. So that means being in the world. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself because he's going he's gonna to talk about this. But keep this in mind. All right. Let's 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 move along. Let's get to the, the reading and then we'll, I'll, I'll explain that. Verse 15. I pray not for them. Did I finish 14? No, let me finish 14 first. I have given uh, them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world. That's why they hate the world. The world is not going to convince me, they're not going to brainwash me to think like them. I'm always going to think like Jesus Christ. Well, how do we continue to think like Jesus Christ? By doing what? having his spirit in us, allowing the spirit of God to lead us, what? According to his what? His word. his word. And so my thinking doesn't come from political correctness. My thinking comes from the spirit of God through the word of God. That's how I, that's how I think. That's how I chase in my mind. That's how I build my disciplines and my character, not from this world. Now, see, the thing you have to keep in mind, a lot of times what's happening is that we have we won't do the things of the world, but we also find pleasure in them that do it. We got to be careful with that. Check ourselves. That's because it's easy to do and it gets real. You can slide down that slide real easy. I'm not doing nothing, but I don't mind, you know, I, I don't mind like watching it on a movie or watching it on TV. I don't mind doing all that. We got to be careful of how we our attitude, what our attitude is towards it, towards certain things that we know are wrong. And how do we embrace or endorse certain things? Now, I'm not here to set any rules for anybody. And I will not set any rules because the rules are set by you and the Spirit of God that's in you. That's what the rules are set. Because some people, as we get ready to get into this whole aspect, let me read it before I even make this next statement. Verse, uh, verse 15, I pray not that thou should have taken them out of the world. Oh, he don't want us to come what? Out of the world. But that thou should have keep them from the evil. The evil what? Of this world. All right. So therefore, we shouldn't indulge in the e evil, though we are in it. We're here in it. Yes, sir. That's why some people, I disagree with them when they say they have homeschooled and they try to keep their kids from the world. Mm -hmm. Because God is saying that we're in the world and we have to be in the world. So you can't really take your kid out of the world. You know, they try to like in a sense take the kid out of the world mm -hmm. and just have home things and they never experience the world. So then when the world when they get old and they go out in the world, they don't they most of them don't survive. They have culture shock, right. exactly. It's important for us to keep in mind he has us here in the world. But it sounds like you're saying what I tell Gabrielle, like when you have a little voice in the back of your mind saying, don't do that, right. don't do that. That's that's your spirit telling you something that's right. You mm -hmm. should listen to that. Because, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, that's how it sounds, it sounds like what you were saying. Exactly, exactly. When the spirit of God has is, is in you, you're going to know what to do to a certain degree. All right? A lot of it comes with maturity as you go in. And, you, and yes, you, mo you may make your mistakes here and there, but the spirit of God will never change. It's always going to be correct. What was right yesterday is right today. All right. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you don't impose your what, what God reveals to you. You don't impose that on other people. That's what the Pharisees did. That was the problem they had. All right. And so we can get we can get deep into that as well, too. All right. But he's and and, and let me just deal with this other part real quick. Well, we're getting close to time again. I've def we definitely got to finish this. But let me I have to say this. We should not get so to the point, and, and, and uh, uh, Haywood, he, he, he touched on that. We want to isolate ourselves. Because, see, not only sometimes do they want to just do the homeschooling and keep their kids from anything, but then they say, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go to 
the, the, the church fellowship building. Then we're going to go to the Christian picnic. Then when we go to work, all the Christians at work are going to eat lunch together. And then uh, after work, we're going to all gather at the, at the fellowship, you know, uh, a gathering. And what, what do you end up doing? you isolating yourself. See, don't, don't isolate, insulate. It's a difference. Don't let the world get in you. But you have to be in this world because you have to be a witness. And that is the key. People think that just being a witness means that, you know, you got to bang people over the head, you know, with what being a witness just means show your light in this world. All right. Now, have you ever been driving and then you see a car and you go, wow, I would sure like to get that car. You, you, we've all seen that, right? You see, you, you see a car and you go, wow, that's a nice car. I sure would like to get it. Now, let me ask you something. Did that man get out the car and say, you better believe that this is the best car you ever seen. And you better make your heart feel like you want this car. Did, that, did the person driving that car have to do that to you? No, all he had to do was what? Drive by you with the car. And you said, I like that car. I think I want to get one. All right? And so a lot of times that's what a witness is. Be in this world. But don't get so hung up. And that's another problem that we have. We get people, we get people that's fanatical, you know, and they're walking down, down the street with billboards. And, and then the, world, the people that, that, that might want to come to God, but then look at that individual and go, well, I don't want to be a nut like this guy. You know, so we got to be careful. L let God do the work. We just have to be a witness. A witness to what? A witness to what God is doing. So it's important that we keep that in mind. So we don't want to be, uh, um, you know, strange. We want to be different. There's a difference between that. See, there's a lot of people that I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I know some nutcases. <laughs> All right. And they they and they, are, they are nuts for Jesus. I don't know how, how else to say it, but they, they, they're, they're not balanced. And I, and I feel bad. For, and, I, and I pray. I said, Lord, you know, you know, we, we all need help. Help us all in our, in our circumstances. All right. But in verse 17, he gets right to the to the crux. He said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy what word is truth? We're sanctified. Now, sanctified means set aside, set apart, utilized for the purpose intended. That's why you got to know what your, what, what your course is so you can finish it. You can do what you were intended to do here. See how all this connects? Now, um, you go home and you want to get a cup of coffee. Uh, or, or a cup of Kool-Aid or whatever it is. You go to your cupboard and you get what? A cup or a mug. And that cup or mug has been cleaned and set aside for the purpose to be used. You don't put the cup, at least most people don't, don't put the cup in with the spoons and the forks. Spoons and the forks go where? And the cups go. So when you want a spoon and a fork, where do you go? When you want a cup, when you want a plate, that's what we are. That's what sanctification is. Be where you're supposed to be so that when God wants to use you, guess what? When I, when I want a, a, a teacher, when I want an exhorter, when I want a, a, a joy-filled laugh, you know, this person that just brings joy to every situation, when I want a, 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 a rebuker, when I want a prophet, whenever I want, if you're in your right place, guess what I can do? I can use you. All right? And some, most, what happens a lot of times is we don't, we don't get in his word. We don't let the spirit get in us. We never know who we are, and we're all over the place. I don't know what I am. Just spoon laying out, laying up there with the, with the saucer cups. And you need to be in there with the rest of the spoons. And right? you're just all in the wrong place. All right. And so it's important, uh, you know, and, and I'm making it. That's an analogy, but it's a, it's a whole lot more to it than just that sanctification is. But that gives you a crux of it. And because we're running out of time, I have to kind of move along here. 
All right. Uh, verse 18, he says, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I also send them into the world. See, he ain't trying to keep, keep us out of the world. He wants us in it. He, I'm sending you in there. He sent, he allowed those Hebrew boys to go where? In the fire. God throwing us in this fiery world. This God, this world is so bad. I know. Go on and get in there. Get in there. And it will hurt you and it will break your heart. It will make you cry. It will make you sad. But remember this, your best day is still coming. So, yes. And if they, because if this world hated Jesus, guess what? It's going to hate you. All right. Verse 19. It says, for thy sake, for, for, for their sake, I sanctify myself that they also may be what? Sanctified through the truth. What is truth? Thy word is truth. Keep this in mind. So through truth. Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall come, which shall believe on me through their what? Word. All right. That speaks of even the writings of Paul, the writings of Peter, all the words that these apostles are going to say. That's why we're here. That's why we're talking and sharing. All right. So Jesus, guess what? This prayer right here. He prayed for you. He's praying for you. He, he I'm praying for all of them that shall come. That includes us. All right. Verse 21. That they also may be one. Who? That they. Who's the they? We are. We are we're the they in this prayer that they may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Ooh, I, I'm, I'm running out of time. But what did Jesus just say? That I want to be in you, Father, you want to be in me, and I want them to be one, where? In us. Remember I told you before what God, what, what God is doing with the saints, where he is inviting us into him. In relationship you know that's the thing that really just got Satan upset because he he could see somehow or another I I, 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 I could see he was like <coughs> wait a minute if I'm the chief cherub how come they're gonna have a position in you now what some people do with verses like this which is wrong is that they said, oh, see, this shows us if I'm going to be in God and the Father, like Jesus is in the Father, like the Holy Ghost is in the Father, and Jesus is God and the Holy Ghost is God, that makes me God. No, it don't. Remember before I told you about that and when, we, when we were talking about it in Psalms with little g? That's what it makes us. Okay? We're an invited guest in the relationship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We were invited in. But we are not of the because we because God made us, nobody made God. God all and see, it's hard for us to understand, but He always existed, so we can never be God. But God said, I mean, He just said, You know what? No, you cannot be me, there's no way you could be me, but I'm inviting you into my experience. That's what that connecting to the vine is. You're going to be a part of who we are, which is. Which is why we're going to also get to the point where we're going to judge angels, the scriptures say. You see, I told you, your best day is on its way. You got a, you got a, you got a day coming that you're going to be like, it was all worth it. It was worth it. It was worth it. I don't care what this world did, but you got to get through this. And, and getting through it, is, 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 you, you're going to have your heartaches. You're going to have your fears. You're going to have your tears. You're going to have all that. But man, you, somehow or another, you got to just get down, knuckle under, and say, somehow, some way, I got to get through this because my best day is still coming. This world is not going to beat me down. It's not, and this world is not going to deceive me. And that's the other thing about this world. A lot of people have been deceived by it. All right, well, let me finish up here. Verse 22. And the glory which thou giveth me, I give who? Them. Wait a minute. The same glory that the Father gave Jesus, Jesus is giving us. Ah, what a relationship. Right? But once again, that don't make you God. 
It make you what? It make you a created being that God shared his glory with. That's all it makes you. All right? Um, the, uh, verse 22. The glory which thou hast given me, I gave them that they may be one even as we are one. See the uniqueness here that he wants us to have, the relationship, the fellowship. Now, if he's given us collectively as the bride of Christ that same oneness, that same uh, 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 glory to be one, what should we be? We should be one. But see, what, that, what a lot of people think is being one means being identical. And that's not true. You don't have to be identical to be one. Remember that. All right, and then we're going to move along. We can explain that a little bit deeper, but we're going to just move on. Verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made what? Perfect, Perfect in one. That the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved, me, loved them as thou hast loved me. The Father is going to love us like he loves who? Jesus. All right. This is what we got to look forward to. Our best day. And, and now, once again, remember I told you about time? In reality, from God's perspective, it's already happened. It's already happened. But see, from our point of view, we got to go through this thing, this, this little jail cell that we're in called time. We have to travel through it. Second by second, nanosecond by nanosecond, we got to travel through this aspect of time. But from God's perspective, it already has happened. Right? And I'm not going to get too much into that, but that's a, that could be a whole other 20 minutes. 24. Father, I sin, I, I, Father, I will, I will that thou also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. That speaks of who? Us. Jesus wants us to be where? Where he is. That they may behold my what? Glory. He wants to show us what he showed nobody else. His glory. All right. And we could get into that. I mean, there's a whole lot to deal with that. And the aspect of God, be, of, of, of Jesus being the, uh, of the church being the bride and Jesus being the what? The, the, the husbandman. And in that relationship, there are things that the husband and the wife share with each other that nobody else knows anything about. Same kind of thing. Jesus is saying what, 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 what the, the, the bride will have with the, with the bridegroom, what Jesus will have with the church, will be what no other creation, what no other crea created entity has ever experienced. That's what we're going to have with with, uh, with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right? Through Christ. Through Christ we're going to do this. For thou hast loved me before the foundation of the world. Verse 25. O righteous Father. Remember, he's still praying. The world have not known thee. See? The world has not known thee. But I have known thee, and these have known uh, that thou has sent me. Verse 26, and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. All right. We're going to stop there. We'll pick up on verse, on chapter tw uh, 18 on next week. But you see how significant this prayer of Jesus is? It's extremely significant as he begins to identify uh, our relationship with uh, each other and with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's very, very important. Any other comments or questions?